Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of the Sunday Night Sit Down. I am your host, Miracle Jones. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. As always, the Sunday Night Sit Down is an opportunity for us to have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with a candidate who is running for office. And we are very excited this evening to welcome uh, State Rep Emily Kincaid. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. We're really excited to be here. Yes, I know it's a very, very busy campaign season, so we're very um, fortunate to have you. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about how this campaign season has been for you? I know um, Pennsylvania is like in the middle of like everything right now. So how are you doing? I mean, it's been a little crazy. Uh, I, um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar, but um, I had a primary challenge that was supported by the Democratic Party. And largely because I didn't wait in line and ask permission, I just ran for office. And so uh, folks that weren't happy about that found somebody else to run against me. And uh, so it was a contentious primary election, which I'm excited that I won overwhelmingly. The, the people in District 20 uh, were not as as bitter about uh, me winning and being their representative as uh, some of the folks that, that uh, ran my opponent against me. So that was good. Now going into uh, the fall election, I have a, a Republican challenger and and it is it's it's interesting to to see you know, the dynamics of, of now that Roe has been overturned and the candidates that we have on the Republican side who are openly saying that they want to basically overturn elections and decide which elections they deem as valid and that they're going to number one priority ban all abortion with no exceptions in Pennsylvania. They're already moving on a a state constitutional amendment. Um, so this is a really fraught election um, and and probably one of the, and I, we say this every year, it's the most significant election of our lifetimes. And and I think we're right every single time, but I, I don't think that we will see an election like this again, where we have so many just issues that are on the ballot, depending on which candidates you support. Like it, it, we are literally a pro-democracy or overturning a democracy, pro-reproductive justice or stripping away birthing people's rights. These are on the ballot at every level from US Senate all the way down to state representative. And 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 I, I hope that people understand the urgency of this election uh, really more than any other. Thank you so much for that. And you talked a lot about the issues. Um, this is will be like your second term. So talking about running in unprecedented times, what really spurred you to run for office the first time? You said, you know, you weren't picked out of a hat. You basically saw some issues and decided to run. What motivated you to take um, the seat in office? Um, I mean, I think like with a lot of women, 2016 certainly uh, motivated me to run. Um, I was clerking for a judge at the time, so I wasn't able to get involved in politics in 2018 the way that, you know, we saw Summer Lee and Sarah Inamorato and Lindsay Williams um, sort of jump into the fray. But it did give me a moment to kind of look around and say, the issues that we're facing aren't just because we're electing bad politicians, but also because we're electing good politicians that aren't doing anything. So people who by and large agree with us, but aren't actually advocates, they're not fighting back, they're not pushing back on the issues and they're not being proactive about the things that, that we can get uh, accomplished. And so I was looking around my neighborhood and, and realizing that my predecessor was very much one of those people who, you know, had been in office for a long time, really had not done a lot really had never spoken on the floor of the house, didn't advocate for anything. And we were seeing those effects all across the district from 
blight to gentrification and 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 just a real need to have somebody who's going to be an advocate an outspoken advocate for these issues and so I decided to run because I was like, look, if, if Trump can be president, <laughs> I am wildly more qualified than that man uh, to hold an elected office. And so I decided to run and and give the, the people in District 20 a choice. And they chose me. And I appreciate that. And I've been really trying to take it seriously ever since to let people know that I'm I am going to advocate for them. Thank you so much. And when it comes to your advocacy, what is your political philosophy? Like, how do you decide um, to, when you're going to speak on the floor, if you're going to speak on the floor, the issues um, that you want to co-sponsor? Like, how do you go about that thought process? I mean, a lot of the things that I do in terms of legislation come out of conversations that I have with constituents. It's it's conversations that I have about, you know, here is an issue that I'm facing and I don't know what to do about it. And so realizing that like this requires a legislative fix. Um, so right now I'm, I'm working uh, with a constituent on um, making Pennsylvania a state that provides free lunches for all students so that we're not doing, you know, this kind of school lunch debt thing uh, because we're seeing other states are, are just providing free lunch for, for students. Um, and how do we make Pennsylvania a place that can do that? So that's where a lot of the legislation comes from. I have a bill that that would provide landslide insurance because no, you can't get insurance for landslides if they impact your property. Um, and, and we're seeing all across our region really devastating impacts of landslides because of climate change. Um, so that's where the, the legislative kind of process largely comes from is conversations with people and being like, we need to make a legislative fix. And if nobody's doing it, then I will do it. Um, but when it comes to speaking on the floor and speaking up in committee, uh, I mean, a lot of it is I, I rely on on the expertise that I have as a lawyer, as somebody who's done policy work uh, prior to being a lawyer, and and realizing that like I have the ability to explain an issue in a way that maybe other people who are on the committee or you know other people who are speaking on the floor are not explaining it and. And to develop sort of the record, if you will, like even if we don't succeed on on defeating a piece of legislation, at least it's out there, uh, you know, maybe for the courts to consider or for for people who are watching to consider that this is why this is a problematic issue. Um, and then there are times where, uh, you know, I will hear a, another representative say something that I'm like, this is incorrect or you're not understanding this or you are misrepresenting the reality of things. And, and so I sit one seat in from, from Austin Davis on the floor. And so a lot of times I'm like, Austin, get out of the way. The Republican said something stupid. <laughs> so um, it's kind of mixed. Yeah. That's, that's really great. You have that the camaraderie, um, you know, as a, a newer elected official, and you talked a little bit about like how your campaign has been different, you know, this time around, has there been really any surprises um, as you're meeting people, because you had um, redistricting as well. So how has this campaign really shaped um, uh, your engagement in, in comparison to your first campaign? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely different because my, my current district is about two thirds city of Pittsburgh. My newly redrawn district is majority outside the city of Pittsburgh. So I, I represent all the same municipalities that I currently represent, but in different proportions. So I will have all of Ross Township in my new district. And right now I only have a, like a small piece of it. And, and actually uh, Sarah Inamorato represents about two thirds of Ross Township right now. So it is learning to a degree a little bit more of the issues um, that impact areas like Ross, um, you know, and, you know, I've been working with Bellevue and Avalon and, and Westview, but, um, but I think there are, there are different issues that impact uh, our, our more suburban areas a little bit differently. So there's not, we don't, there's no um, housing authority properties in Ross Township, but there is definitely housing issues and they're just different. Um, you know, they have the same kind of landslide issues that we see in the north side, but, um, you know, some of it is also caused by development and how do we adapt to, to make sure that we're developing responsibly. Um, 
so it, it's it's largely the same conversations just from a, a different perspective but you know the, fundamentally folks are, are the same everywhere they want to make sure that they're they're making a living wage so that they can keep a roof over their heads and food on the table they want to be able to send their kids to good schools they want their kids to be safe when they're outside of their houses they want their kids to be safe when they're inside their houses and uh you know they want them to have a better life than what they had so it's it's largely the same conversations um with with folks but you know just in a in a slightly different perspective thank you so much i think it's really great to like for you to be um, honest about like, hey, this is my my district changes and these are some of the issues. I think sometimes people feel pressure to be like, e everyone's the same, everything's the same. Um, and I think that really goes talking about like your advocacy and making sure you're representing your constituents. And so thank you so much for that. But you talked a little bit, you know, um, about some of the issues in meeting people now. You unfortunately, um, um, earlier, you know, this year we had the Easter, you know, massacre on the north side, and we have a lot of conversations, you know, almost every day about like public safety. What is the balance? And so, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to doing um, as the elected official to address concerns around like public safety? So, I think the the biggest thing for me is really making sure that people understand that public safety doesn't mean mass incarceration. It doesn't mean locking people up for long periods of time because, you know, it, it doesn't mean sentencing enhancements. Sentencing enhancements don't have any deterring effect on the underlying crime. All that they fundamentally are is something that's performative to legislate vengeance into our justice system. And so I think that it's important when people are advocating for public safety, that they understand what actually makes their neighborhoods, their communities safe. And it's not locking people up who've committed crimes forever and throwing away the key. It is investing in the kinds of programs that prevent crime. It's empowering our courts to be able to give people, uh, you know, divergence programs without them actually having to get a criminal record in order to get into addiction treatment or mental health treatment. Um, and, and it, you know, we're seeing an uptick in crime as, as we very often do when there's significant economic instability. And I need, you know, I, I work to try and get people to understand that, you know, crime is not increasing because our communities are inherently unsafe or getting more unsafe. They are unstable. And, and the way that we stabilize our communities and make them safer is by investing in the people in our communities to make sure that they have a living wage, that they can afford childcare, that they can get employment. Uh, second chance employment has been a big issue of mine to make sure that people who are returning citizens from being incarcerated can get jobs because the number one thing to reducing recidivism rates is employment. And if we have a hiring crisis right now where we have a bunch of jobs that are going unfilled, we should be prioritizing making sure that we're marrying this untapped pool of talent with the need for, for hiring folks. And, and people should understand that, that criminal records are not something that makes someone inherently incapable of doing a job. Um, so I, I try to get people basically to, I, I think we all tend to, to hit the panic button a little bit of like, there's a danger. And so we need to, you know, do broken windows policing and lock everybody up and anybody who's a danger should be locked up. And it's like, that's, we tried that. It didn't work. It actually, you know, things got worse. And there are better ways that we know about now to make our communities safe, build our communities, make them stronger while investing in the people in our communities. Thank you so much for that. I know you're talking about investing in people. We know that the Build Back you know, Better plan has been um, a, a topic of late, especially you know, with the Fern Hollow Bridge. Are there any type of investments that you're looking to seeing within um, your district, anything that you want to um, highlight um, as you're going into your second term? So the big, when we're talking about infrastructure investment, the big things that I, I really want to see. Um, so Ross Township has three different intersections right now that they have had 
multimodal grants um, out for, for through PennDOT, grants through PennDOT. Um, I'm trying not to use the jargon, but I fall right into it. <laughs> Um, but it's a, it, you know, there are a couple grants through PennDOT and, uh, it, it turns out that those grants are not enough money. And, and these are intersections at major thoroughfares, um, that are, are necessary in getting to be really important investments, um, that need to be made, but we, you know, Ross can't move forward on them because they don't, once they start the project, they need all the money to be able to finish it. And so I'm working with the township commissioners right now and the appropriations committee and, and trying to identify funding so that they can get those, those projects moving. Um, you know, I, I really want to make sure that everyone feels safe in all of the infrastructure that, that we have, you know, all of our roads and bridges, we're the city of bridges and, you know, everybody who's crossing a bridge should feel confident that they're going to make it to the other side. Um, and I, so I want to make sure that we're, we're investing in that, but also infrastructure isn't just roads and bridges. It's also, you know, cell phone infrastructure, it's broadband infrastructure. It's the ability to access the things that really have become, you know, sort of fundamental utilities. They're not privileges, they're necessities now when it comes to applying for jobs and, you know, communicating and going to school and learning and, and being able to do research for a paper that's due, you know, the next day. So, and, and being able to do that in your home and not feeling like you have to leave and go somewhere else uh, to, to be able to do something that, you know, other people are able to do within their home. So the Build Back Better plan and the infrastructure plan is, is incredibly important to be able to do that. The, the only problem is it only is going to fund about 10% of our infrastructure needs. Um, so the other thing that I'm working with a number of my state colleagues on is really pushing the federal government to establish a national infrastructure bank. And, and we have had a national infrastructure bank at five points in time in the history of Pennsylvania. And at each point in time, that's when we have seen the most growth and investment in our infrastructure. Like the our federal highway system was built because of a national infrastructure bank. All of our roads, you know, our, our major roads and bridges, all of the uh, investment from the um, from the New Deal basically ran through a national infrastructure bank. And it basically provided low cost loans to municipalities um, to to build up their infrastructure and you know states and whatnot. Um, who didn't have the, the access to that money on their own. And it ran, it always ran so well that it actually made money for the government. It never, it was never a deficit. It was, all, it always made money for the government. And we had every single point in time, world-class infrastructure as a result of this investment. And, and now we've almost forgotten that that's how we built our, our entire system and now we're doing this, you know, public private partnership stuff and and it just it doesn't work. There's not the kinds of availability and and we shouldn't privatize our roads and bridges and our infrastructure. That's that gets dangerous. Ask PWSA, uh, you know, when it was privatized under the Ravenstall administration to a degree and and we ended up degrading our lead pipes and now we have lead in our waters. Uh, thank you. Uh, and those seems like a, there's a lot, you know, that goes <laughs> yeah. into, you know, uh, and people, I think it's I think it's very cool for people to see like how transparent you are so they know what's happening. Because I think like right now there's this conversation about like how transparent our process is. Um, and so I do thank you for talking about all the, the different issues and limitations. And one of the things we, for some reason, still in Pennsylvania are having these conversations around elections, election integrity. We know the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court you know, just a couple of weeks ago said, you know, Act 77 was constitutional. So as you're out here um, campaigning, are you also still hearing people talk about how safe is our is our elections? Are you having to have any type of those conversations? Um, I mean, I haven't had a lot of those conversations. And I think part of it is that, you know, sort of the, the bubble that we live in in Allegheny County uh, in a lot of places and, and particularly my district by and large, it's a, it's a democratic area. So the 2020 election was not controversial to, to a lot of the folks that I talked to. Um, but I mean, certainly my Republican colleagues are peddling this story that we have to 
do all of these things to make our elections safer. And, and I've been really trying to be proactive in my official capacity to educate people about the fact that the 2020 election and hereafter was the safest, most secure election in Pennsylvania history. We had a paper trail of, of our voting machines. We, you know, we knew exactly where everything was going. Even, you know, voting by mail was incredibly secure. And, uh, and so, you know, I have my count every vote button, but, um, you know, I hear my colleagues talk about, well, it's like a football game. And what if the referees just added a whole bunch of points after the game was over? And, and it's like, that's not the analogy. The analogy for, for what happened in 2020 and 2021 in counting the votes was they, there, there were points scored and no one put them up on the board until after the game was over. And so you still had to count all of the legitimately scored points. And so, yeah, it's strange because that's not how you're used to playing a football game, if you will. But that's, that is how the, the election was working is those were legitimate points. They just didn't make it up on the board in the time that you were expecting them to be on the board. But, you know, the team that won won. So, but I hear them talk about this, and, you know, and, and it's like, this is not a game. This is people's lives. When we are talking about access to voting and getting people out and voting, it is determining whether or not we're investing in the most significant things that we can invest in. You know, we're talking about health care. We're talking about people's rights. We're talking about criminal justice reform. We're talking about child care. We're talking about our schools and you know, every level of things that if people do not have the right to say, you know, who should represent them in their government because someone somewhere doesn't like it and they shut that down, we no longer have a democracy. We have a dictatorship and, and that is what is being pushed. So, so I, I definitely am trying to educate people on, on the urgency of now to understand just how, you know, really on the precipice we are of, of a crumbling democracy if we don't take this seriously. Um, and you talked about like the work that you're doing and you mentioned it earlier that you did not get the endorsement um, uh, of, the, of the party. There's this ongoing conversation about, you know, Southwestern Pennsylvania is creating a lot of diversity of candidates, particularly women who are running for office. Um, what ha for you, you know, personally, what do you, you attribute that to? And then what has your experience been with and getting support, not just from the party, but for other people um, as you like, you're not only running, but trying to introduce legislation? There's definitely a, a sort of a divide between voters in Allegheny County and the, you know, the more establishment of Allegheny County is, you know, when I was door knocking in 2020, I ran into so many people who were like, thank you. We need more women. I'm so excited to vote for a woman. I'm so excited to vote for a young woman. And, and the number of older women that I spoke with who were like, I wish that I could have run for office. I, I, I wish that I was your age now because I would run for office. And there's this generation of women who lacked absolute investment from, from not just the party, but just you know, generally. And I think that we are finally at a point where it's like women and, and people of color and the people who have been traditionally shut out of being in elected office are no longer having to rely on the same systems to support them. They don't have to pay their dues. They don't have to wait in line. They don't have to kiss the ring. They can just run because there are other untapped sources of support that you know, even 10 years ago did not exist to get people elected regardless of whether or not the, the party supports them. Um, and so I, I think that that's a really incredible moment in time for us to be in where it's like, you don't have to wait in line. There are other structures that will help you to get elected. Now, we I think we do have to be careful though because we don't wanna end up creating a system where, you know, it's just sort of a, a, a new girls club instead of an old boys club where, you know, we're still shutting people out 
rather than, you know, bringing collective power together. And so, you know, I think there's, there is a need to be aware that, you know, just because I don't agree with, you know, somebody else, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't at least, you know, give them the time of day. They're technically, they're still a Democrat. So, you know, let's, let's build the big tent and make it actually inclusive of everybody because Otherwise, you're going to end up with this pendulum back and forth where it's going to be new people and then there's going to be a resurgence of the old people and back and forth. And and I think we have the potential to build a new party together. Um, so so I think that that's that's something to be aware of. But when it comes to, to legislation and moving legislation forward, the Republicans are in the majority. So by and large, Democratic legislation does not move. Um, but we have, but I, I absolutely get support from my leadership to introduce legislation and do things the way that I want to do. I'm never really ever told no, uh, no, you can't do that, or no, we we don't want you to do that. Sorry, the hair. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, what I have heard, interestingly enough, from my female Republican colleagues is that that is how the Republican Party operates, and that they actually try to get their women to like infight and they'll take something from one of them and give it to another one. And, and that's not been my experience in the democratic party in the democratic house caucus that, you know, if you have an idea, we want you to run with it. We want you to succeed and, you know, let us know what it is that we can do to help and support you. Um, that's, that's been my experience. And, and, you know, man, woman, black, white, uh, Latino, um, Asian, as as we are building a more diverse caucus, I haven't seen or experienced or heard of anybody experiencing, you know, sort of being shut down uh, if they have new and innovative ideas. Thank you. Um, and I think it's a, such a crucial time because like you bitch at the top of the hour, you know, I don't think anyone had on their scorecard that like Roe was going to be overturned, you know, this year. There was like so much happening, but now like we're here and a lot of um, reproductive justice issues is now focused in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Um, And so how is that? Like, cause you're, cause you are one of the first women in your position, you're, you're running and now this landmark case is happening. Um, as you're launching your you know, your your uh, re-election campaign, so how has that been? That added pressure, and what are some of the demands that you have had of like leadership and others um, going forward? Yeah, I mean, it is definitely something that we are talking about all the time: is reproductive justice and abortion as healthcare. And and I mean, this is this is my other pin as abortion as healthcare, <laughs> um, but. Yeah, I I think we have to keep it at the forefront because it's something that I think a lot of people took for granted that Roe was never going to actually get overturned. This was never going to actually happen. And and then it did. And now we are there abortion is illegal in a number of states including Ohio and West Virginia. And so we are seeing a massive influx of out of state patients. Um, So one of the things is, you know, Pennsylvania really making sure that people understand that abortion is still legal in Pennsylvania. It is still accessible. Our abortion providers in Pennsylvania are working incredibly hard to make sure that abortions are accessible, not just for Pennsylvanians, but also for people coming from out of state. And I'm really proud of my councilman, Bobby Wilson, for introducing and getting past uh, the first of its kind in the nation shield laws uh, for for Pittsburgh to be a place that says we are not going to cooperate with these overreaching out of state uh, governments that are going to try and criminalize our providers or criminalize people who are trying to help people access abortion care in Pennsylvania because it's legal. And if for whatever reason, uh, abortion should become illegal in the state of Pennsylvania, that Pittsburgh would deprioritize actually enforcing uh, these anti-abortion laws. So I'm incredibly proud of of him for doing that. Um, And I am part of a group of legislators that's introducing similar legislation for the state uh, at the statewide level. Um, but you know, it's, it, the, the Republicans put a pause on passing our budget 
in June and, and actually pushed it into July because they just had to, in the middle of the night, start the process of uh, saying that our state constitution does not protect the right to an abortion. So it's going to be a battle and we need to win more seats in the state legislature. We need to keep a Democrat as governor. Absolutely, positively, that is that is incredibly important. But we also need to make gains in the state legislature because if we don't take the majority in at least one of the chambers, they are going to pass this state constitutional amendment through a second time next session. And then it's going to be on the ballot. Now, I have confidence in Pennsylvania voters that they're going to be even more liberal than Kansas voters who voted down a similar, uh, uh, you know, ban on on protecting abortion in their constitution. But, you know, it's going to it's going to show up at the ballot box and it's probably going to be on our ballot at a time when the least number of voters actually vote, which is during a municipal primary election. So we need to make sure that people are aware of this. And, and, you know, that's really what I'm working on in this election is to be like, look, we need to, we need to elect a democratic governor. We need to elect Democrats up and down the ballot everywhere because this, our rights are on the ballot and it's, it's abortion, but it's also elections. It's also voting rights because in the same bill that uh, the, you know, just passed, they're also coming for, uh, you know, they, they want to audit elections. They want to uh, enshrine voter ID in our constitution. Um, and they want to limit the powers of the governor to be able to uh, oversee regulations. And and so it's it's a whole bunch of bad, bad things that, that are potentially coming our way. And so people have to be aware of that. And, and Democrats, if we can take the majority and at least one house can stop it cold, and otherwise, you know, we got to get voters aware and, and working on it. Thank you. I know it's still a lot <laughs> happening. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I know you're, like, you're very, very busy. But one, as we wind down our interview, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, Pennsylvania, there's a lot of stuff happening. And one of the things that are a lot of concern, whether maternal mortality or the incarceration rate, is the racial disparities that impact our region. Um, I know, like I said, you are a newer uh, elected official, um, but what are some of the changes that you have seen and what are some of the things that you hope to see in the future to address some of the racial disparities in the region? So I'm, despite the fact that it was overshadowed by this really egregious uh, anti-choice amendment to the constitution, I'm really proud of the budget that we were able to get passed because it does invest in the kinds of things that, that will hopefully address maternal mortality rates and criminal justice issues and, and you know, gun violence and a lot of the things that, that disproportionately impact our, our black and brown communities. And, and one of the things that, the, one of the reasons we were able to get a, a budget that spent all of our American Rescue Plan funds, which the Republicans have been sitting on forever, um, as well as a significant amount of the surplus that we have brought in in revenue in, in the state in the past two years um, to invest in schools and mental health treatment and all of these different things, is that Democrats stuck together. So yes, we're in the minority, but they could not get a budget passed without Democratic support. And we held strong conservative Democrats, liberal Democrats all across the board. And, and you know, to his credit, the, the governor also, you know, really stuck to his guns about we are investing in education. We are getting we are going to spend the ARP money in a way that helps people. Um, so I've been really gratified to see like the, the real investments that are coming in that capacity, because I think that that's going to make a big change, um, especially because we're seeing massive, like really unprecedented levels of investment in our most underfunded school districts, which by and large are BIPOC school districts. Um, and and so it's it's really exciting to see this come through. And it's largely we have an incredible leader in Joanna McClinton 
and uh, and and our whip Jordan Harris and uh, and Matt Bradford, who is um, really like the only white person who is the a major member of our our leadership team who was negotiating the budget. Um, and I think that's making the difference is we finally have black leadership in places where they get to stand at the leader's mic and take the Republicans to task for not letting us speak, for not, you know, for shutting down debate, for not talking about the things that matter and and for, you know, attacking Philadelphia when none of them live there. Um, and I think that's making a difference in the way that we're, we're actually talking about stuff. Uh, I also think that especially in terms of, of maternal mortality rates uh, for black women, Morgan Cephas is co-chair of the, the Women's Health Caucus and has done just a, an incredible, incredible job of advocating for that issue and making it an issue that isn't just a black women's issue, but an issue that, you know, Democratic colleagues care about, but also Republican colleagues care about. Uh, because we don't want to be 47th in the nation in terms of mat maternal mortality. And hey, what's the number one driver of why it is that we are so low on that? It's because we're not investing in, in ensuring that Black women get through pregnancy in a healthy way. And, and so now we have this Medicaid expansion that will cover postnatal care up to a year rather than 60 days, which 60 days used to be one 15 minute visit. That's all you got. And now it's a year long process that we're hopefully going to be able to prevent maternal mortality that happens postpartum. That's a lot. So again, I want to thank you so much uh, for sitting down with us on the Sunday night sit down. Um, look, as we wrap, how can people learn more about you? Um, do you have, are you on social media? Uh, what is your website? So people um, can reach out and talk to you. Yeah, I am on all the social media except TikTok. Um, I'm I'm terrible at taking pictures of myself, so I'm certainly I'm bad at videos. But um, so I'm on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, my campaign handle is Emily the number four P A the number twenty. So Emily four P A twenty. And uh, and then if people want to follow me on my official side, it's Rep Kincaid, R E P K I N K E A D. Um, and then my my campaign website is also www.emily the number four p a twenty dot com. Uh, so we try to be consistent, so it's easy to remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so you know, follow me on social media. Uh, you know, reach out to me through my website. Um, all of the issues and positions that I have are available on my campaign website. Uh, if you want to look me up on my uh, my official side, you can see the th the bills that I've sponsored and the the memos that I've of bills that I'm I'm working on introducing right now, um, as well as you know the committees that I'm on and and you know information about the various uh, events that I've hosted and will be hosting. So. Uh, so it's all there, and uh, hopefully, I am I will hear from from folks, and I'm happy to engage with anybody if you have any other questions. Um, and of course, I know it's a very contentious season. You know, campaigns. We also have a lot of stuff you know happening um, in the world. But is there anything that's bringing you joy that you're finding joy in at this time? So. When the rain doesn't mess with it, I've been really uh, spending a lot of time doing work around my house. Um, so I, I got a, a power washer <laughs> and sprayed off my deck. And, and so it's been really nice to just kind of re reclaim space for myself to kind of decompress. And I really enjoyed that. So, you know, it's being out in the sunshine and, you know, doing work that, you know, I, I look around and I'm like, man, I did that. And just you know, feeling a real sense of accomplishment in that. So that's that's really what's been bringing me joy of late. All right, well, Representative Emily, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And that has been another edition of the Sunday Night Sit Down. I hope you learn uh, some more information that you did not know. I myself learned a whole lot about what's going on in Pennsylvania. I'm in the legislature, so. Please make sure you are following us on social media at One Hood Power. Reach out to us. We are still um, 
sitting down with people. We have invitations out to politicians all across Pennsylvania, regardless of party. Um, so if there's someone you want us to talk to and we, they haven't been on the show, please reach out, send us the email. We'll reach out to them. We're willing to sit down and have conversations with the folks who um, are running because we want you to make an informed decision. Please make sure you stay tuned. There's some great things happening in uh, Pennsylvania. Reminder, make sure you are registered to vote. Um, our election is going to be November 28th. We have on October 24th to register to vote. So please make sure you're registered if you're um, living in Pennsylvania. You must be um, a resident of Pennsylvania. You have to be 18 by the time the election um, by November 8th. You cannot have been convicted of a federal crime, um, of a, cannot be convicted of an election related crime in the past three years, um, and you cannot be serving a sentence of incarceration um, in order to register to vote. And of course, you must also be a citizen um, of the US. So please make sure you register. If you're registered, double check your registration. Redistricting did happen this year. Um, so you may have a new polling place or a, a different um, a polling site. So make sure you go online and double check your verification. You know, vote.pa.gov um, is where you go to get the most up-to-date information. And as always, hope you have a great Sunday evening. See you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Sunday Night Sit Down. Have a good one. Wow, 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 wow,